This program is supported by Reliance Digital Personalizing Technology. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be here. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of Vicharved uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, especially Salil Bhai, you know, who has been very accord accommodating with my requests. Um, I also like to thank uh, the audience uh, who have chosen to spend your Sunday evening uh, with me here. Uh, I see a lot of my um, family members, my friends who have come from far and wide, uh, and people I have known growing up uh, right here in Madgaon. So thank you all for coming. Um, it makes me quite happy and also a bit nervous, you know, because uh, I know most of you, right? So I think this is uh, one of the most kind of nervous uh, talks for me, and I'll uh, uh, try my best. I have uh, really fond memories of Goman Vidyani Ketan. Uh, as a kid, uh, I used to come here to watch plays, uh, watch uh, musical performances, and I also remember having our school gatherings here. Uh, but never, you know, in my vital's dreams, I would imagine that I'd be speaking from this stage uh, one day. Uh, yeah, but here I am. Hmm. Let me just uh, get my composure. Okay. Also, you know, I don't think anyone uh, from my family have ever seen me talk before. So that also makes me <laughs> a bit, yeah, you know, this has never happened to me before. But, you know, like, okay, hold on, let me take a second. Okay. Um, so this talk, you know, is based on my first-hand experience working uh, at Apple for close to a decade uh, with uh, uh, Steve Jobs personally, with Jonathan Ive, and many other talented um, engineers and designers. Um, also, uh, more than a decade of uh, working at Intel trying to drive innovations. And I'd like to distill you know, all my learnings from these two very different kinds of companies into um, a design philosophy. Uh, and the, the topic of this uh, talk is uh, the Zen philosophy of product design, uh, how to design great products and um, innovate fearlessly. And so when you think of Zen, it invokes imageries like perfectly manicured, uh, Japanese gardens, uh, peace, tranquility. What I was saying was that you know when you think of Apple's design philosophy and uh, the Zen that I just talked about, it's, people think that it's more about aesthetics. Uh, it's partly true, uh, but it actually goes you know much more uh, beyond that. And it took me you know more than 20 years to realize this, or even just to begin to realize this. Um, and and actually by an accident, you know, like two, two years ago last, like two summers ago, I was uh, hiking in, in the Meili Snow Mountains in, in the western China at the border of Tibet. And I saw a sign that said it's the meditation cave of an Indian sounding monk. And so I went to um, explore that cave. And upon reaching the cave, I found out that this cave was the meditation cave of someone called Padmasambhava. And uh, he's known um, as the founder of Tibetan Buddhism. And he traveled across the Himalayas to spread the Buddhist philosophy from India uh, to the Far East. And this got me really interested um, in studying uh, Buddhism, like still at a surface level, not very deep. Um, and in Buddhism, uh, there are three main schools uh, of thought, and Zen belongs to the school called Mahayana Buddhism, which is practiced uh, in China and in Japan. And Steve Jobs was highly influenced by Zen Buddhism. Uh, he was, uh, he had a Japanese Zen master uh, in California, and Zen shaped, shaped his uh, approach to life as well as design. And so what is Zen, right? I think we heard this word Zen, Zen, you know. But Zen actually is the Japanese pronunciation of the word Chan from Chinese, 
and Chan in Chinese means Dhyan from Sanskrit. So uh, it comes from the word meditation. But Zen is not just about meditating in the serene Zendos, it's also about uh, learning the sutras. And one of the most important sutra of Mahayana Buddhism, which Zen belongs to, is called uh, the Mahapradnya Paramita Sutra, or the great book of perfecting wisdoms. And in this uh, sutra, they talk about six wisdoms that one needs to perfect in order to achieve uh, nirvana or singularity or oneness or nothingness, you know, as uh, the Buddhists, you know, uh, think of it. And these six wisdoms are, the first one of them is uh, generosity or dana, uh, ethics or sila, um, effort or virya, uh, not, not your virya, <laughs> uh, um, concentration or dhyana, uh, patience or shanti, and wisdom or prajna. Some of these, these words are Pali, so I don't think it's a direct Sanskrit uh, translation, so you know, uh, don't be hung up on these words, just uh, think about what those, uh, what it means. And understanding and practice of these six wisdoms in the context of design is what I'm going to uh, explain today in my Zen philosophy of product design. So the first wisdom is generosity. And generosity of product design is having a noble cause for creating your product in the first place. It's not about jumping on the latest technology bandwagons or launching the clones of successful startups in a, in a lucrative market, but you need to have a really noble why for creating the product that transcends any material desire. When it came to iPad, uh, sorry, iPod, uh, the vision we had uh, was to create a product that would let you carry a thousand songs in your pocket. You know, Steve Jobs was a huge admirer of music, and this idea that you could carry your entire music library with you, he thought you know, that everyone should have this experience, and he wanted that experience to be the best experience that we could deliver, and that's the goal for creating the iPod in the first place. In my current job at Intel, I go through hundreds of product proposals and, and uh, business plans uh, from our employees, from our startups, and more often than not, what I find that they are driven by where the technology is going or the, where the investments are happening and not from an honest desire to solve a pressing issue or a goal that goes beyond there's money to be made here. Um, they sprinkle you know, buzzwords like AI, chat GPT, AR, VR, and so on. Uh, you know, one of the things is like all these buzzwords we see today, they are just technologies, you know. Technologies are just the tools. They are just a means, not an end. Um, it's like, you know, having a hammer. If you have a hammer, every problem seems like a nail, and you try to hit that nail with that hammer. So when you don't have a strong why, what happens? It's easily easy for you to abandon your goal um, or it's uh, easily you will build substandard product or a compromised company or even an unfulfilling career if you're not choosing things for the right reason. Right? Talking about the career, I like to share my dilemma where I had when at the very beginning of my career, you know, when I was in grade 12, uh, I was in uh, Chogale College and I secured the second highest uh, score in that PCM stream in Goa. And what it meant was I could get into any top uh, computer engineering program across the network of National Institutes of Technology in India. Um, it was because of companies like Infosys, Wipro, programming was really cool and really happening at the time. And so I was advised by everyone I, I, I I went to to go take up computer engineering. Um, but I always liked um, to play uh, with the physical things, physical products, something I could touch and feel, something tangible. Um, and so I took up mechanical engineering at uh, National Institute of Technology, Suratkal. Then, in the first year, 
uh, I scored the highest marks in, in Surat Kal. And there is this tradition that I think the top 10 uh, in, the, in the first year, they get a chance to change their branch. And I was advised, you know, actually my parents were called to Surat Kal, and our principal was trying to counsel them as well as me that I should uh, give up mechanical engineering and join computer science, uh, saying it was a very lucrative field. Um, and I still refused uh, to do that. I was, you know, to me, you know, uh, I really, you know, loved, you know, to, to work with machines and engines and stuff. I had no interest in programming. Um, then, you know, the things went on and it was in the final year and we have campus placements. And what happens in the campus placements is the, the big short companies come in and then they pick up, you know, all the um, <clears throat> bright kids from all different branches. Um, and even you know, then I uh, avoided temptation to uh, take up a job that would pay two to three times what mechanical engineers would get in order to code. So I knew in my heart you know, that I could either be a great mechanical engineer or I could have been an average uh, <clears throat> software developer. And I chose to stick to uh, what I you know, thought I could be best in. So be it a career, a company, or a product, find your true calling. Uh, it could be software engineering as well. You know? So whatever it is, uh, I'm not saying software engineering is bad. I see Gajesh, you know, smiling there. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so basically you find your true calling and give it your all. Don't worry you know, about the payoff. Uh, do it for the right reasons. So, so that's the first, um, the wisdom of product design that you can apply to you know, companies, schools, whatever, career. And once you have uh, a noble cause or a product vision, it's important to have uh, the ethics to turn that vision into reality. And ethics, or sila, is the, the second wisdom of the Zen philosophy of product design. And ethics you know, is how you make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis about your product, your guiding principles on how you conduct your business. Um, at Apple, uh, every little design element was very, very well thought of. It was a result <clears throat> of endless prototyping, thorough analysis, elaborate experimentation. Nothing was random. Every shape, feature, color, size, everything had a reason to exist and be that particular way. Even the color and finish of all our products were carefully chosen after creating hundreds of mock-ups and prototypes. The things you know, that may seem trivial to 99.999% of the people were fretted upon. Um, not only that, we designed the insides of the product as well as we did the outside. And this is something you know, that Steve uh, Jobs brought to the culture. And it, the reason behind this, you know, when he was a kid, Steve Jobs' father would make him paint the fence. <clears throat> and he would insist that the fence should be painted on the inside as good as the fence would be painted on the outside. And when Steve Jobs would, would protest, you know, but dad, <clears throat> no one knows what it looks like on the inside, and he would answer, you and I know. <clears throat> and that's the kind of, of attention to details and ethics we had um, uh, at Apple when designing the products. And Sir Jonathan Ive, uh, the famous chief design officer at, at, at Apple, uh, who was also Steve Jobs' soulmate, he would take that even further um, and apply it not just how we design products, but also how we manufactured them. And to, to give you a sense, in, in, it was about 2010 when we were developing the iPad. I was walking him, um, walking Johnny, uh, through the factory where the iPad's body was being uh, developed. And the iPad body, it starts off <clears throat> as a, a chunk of aluminum. And then we have computerized cutters that cut the shape uh, in different cuts. And at the very end, there is a step, which is where we use 
like a sandpaper like material to smooth off all the cutter marks that have been um, uh, you know, uh, created by, by the cutter. It's just like how an artisan would uh, chisel uh, the stone or carve the wood and in the end polish. And so there was this robot who was polishing uh, the iPad cover and Johnny just stood there for like I think like 15 20 minutes just watching what's going on and he remarked to me and he said this is wrong this is not how an artisan would polish something this is too systematic artisan would use very random strokes and he would randomly rotate the parts can we make the robot do the same thing and I think if anyone is in the manufacturing, uh, we, would, we would know that, you know, this is, uh, adds complexity, adds time, adds cost. And we didn't even know it, it, it could be done. Uh, but I immediately said, yes, we can do it. We will send you a sample. The, the thing is that, you know, there was an unwritten rule at Apple that you could not say no to Johnny or his team. Um, Whatever, you know, uh, it was a sure shot way of getting sidelined from important projects or even get fired. You know, we did not care about our opinion, you know. To me, I knew, you know, how much either you could manufacture in a, in a very uh, regular motion or like an artist and the end result would be the same. Uh, <clears throat> but we had to prove it through data by building samples. Uh, there was, we did not care about our past experiences, expertise, everyone had to actually build things, measure things, uh, and show, show things, right? And so we had this saying there, it said, we, <clears throat> in God we trust, everyone else, please bring data. So for every decision, we had to back it up by data, by putting actually in the hard work. It doesn't matter how expert, what your expertise is, yeah, data talks. We were as obsessed with designing and manufacturing our products as we were to trying to figure out how we could break them. So we would come up with crazy tests. We would look at real life scenarios um, and, and try to see how people would use our products or misuse our products and we would subject our products to batteries of tests that could mimic this everyday use case. There's a guy called Doug Field. Um, he was at that time, he was the VP of our product design, who later went on to lead uh, <clears throat> design and manufacturing team at Tesla. And he used to tell us that you are not your design. Your job is to break, break your design in as many ways as possible, as as soon as possible. Sooner you find problems, <clears throat> sooner you can fix them. So what it meant was, you know, don't be too emotionally attached to what you're building, uh, and don't try to just save it, you know, because of that um, emotional attachment. Try to make the best design possible and find all the issues as soon as possible. <clears throat> so when you buy an Apple product, you can be rest assured that every feature is thoroughly thought through. Every little detail is designed with great care and effort. You know, be it your design, <clears throat> your career, you need to set ethical standards and never compromise, even if it takes huge losses or suffer great setbacks. Now, to hold yourself to such high ethics requires inhuman amounts of effort. Effort, or virya, is the third wisdom of Zen philosophy. Nothing worth doing um, is ever easy. Right? And if you want to build great products and put a dent in the universe, like you know how Steve Jobs used to say, the effort it takes are astronomical. Every product idea um, at Apple, they start with physical mockups and not on PowerPoint presentations. At any given time, we would have dozens and dozens of uh, prototypes in our labs. And Steve Jobs, Johnny Ives, and the heads of engineering, marketing, they would periodically, you know, they would go through all these mock-ups. And then 
um, engineering would take over uh, to investigate further. Engineering team would then engineer the product um, and, and try to basically fit all the technologies within the envelope given to them in the design. And this, you know, um, back and forth would, would keep happening. You know, the designing and building went hand in hand. And for some products, it might take a couple of months to get from the lab to the, uh, to the stage where you, it can become a product. And for some, it could take years. Now, you know, once it is decided that such a product has to be made, it would go on a product roadmap. You know, I think you guys know all this you know, uh, about product roadmap. Um, and once a product is on a product roadmap, it, what it means is you will create a company-wide team to work on that project. And this project would go through many cycles, you know, the, the, uh, or many phases, I would say. The first phase we would call uh, engineering validation, where we would see, can this pro project uh, product, can it be even engineered? And the next phase would be uh, the design verification phase, where we would see, can this engineered product, can it meet all our design requirements? And finally, the third phase would be uh, where we validate if, if this product could be manufactured at scale. And each of these builds, we would build hundreds and hundreds. You know, we would start from uh, dozens, then hundreds, and then thousands. And some of these phases would have lots of like multi multiple builds. So there was a lot of building. And what this meant was that at, that Apple people would be all over Asia. You know, like we would have parts coming from Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, and maybe they would be shipped in the end to Shanghai or Shenzhen. Um, and at any given time, you would have hundreds of Apple engineers just being in China. And there used to be a flight from San Francisco to Shanghai. And every time I would take that flight, there would be at least a dozen of my colleagues on the flight. So every day, there was so much, uh, so many you know, people from Apple would be there in India. Uh, not Sorry, China. Hopefully in India now. Uh, and uh, what it meant was also that, you know, we had to spend long hours at the factory, uh, eat the, the factory canteen food. Uh, people would dread you know, going to China for this build um, because the days were long and there was no way to get a single day off. And so we had this saying, you know, and we even got it printed on our T-shirt, and it said, in China, every day is a Wednesday. So what it meant was, you know, yeah, last weekend was like you know so long ago, and your next weekend is still very very far away. Don't expect to have a single day off in China. And every product designer had to go to China, you know, four to uh, six times a year at the minimum, um, because if you are not there, um, seeing your product being built, uh, you wouldn't know how badly you are designing your products and 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 uh, fix them, right? And eventually. Uh, we put together a full-time uh, product design team in China, um, and I was the, one of the first five employees to join that team. Now, back at the headquarters in California, it was you know, not uh, by any you know, stretch of the imagination like a walk in the park. Uh, there was this sense of urgency. And for, you know, at, during the time I was in California, I was still very young, just you know, graduated from school. Um, um, yeah, so, so we, we would be given tasks. And if we asked, you know, when do you need this by? The answer would always be yesterday, yeah. Or they would say, uh, Johnny asked for it, or Steve Jobs wants to say it, you know. So there is no way, you know, you can escape anything. Everything, you know, had to be done like today or yesterday, right? So there are many tricks people use, you know, throwing names. But it's true, they, you know, they, if you can find an answer now, don't wait for tomorrow. Why, why wait for tomorrow, right? And I remember, you know, like in, in my early days at Apple, I used to do a lot of this <clears throat> architecture and prototyping. So I would design a lot of parts, send it off to our model shop. And then I would go there almost every day to pick up my parts. And there's this guy, Tony, Tony Graham, he used to run, run our labs. And he, he asked me, you know, why you need so many parts? Why you come here every day, you know? And so I said, because Johnny wants to see all these different design options. And he's like, Johnny, 
you know, you kids, you know, he asks you to jump and you ask how high. Uh, and you know, but it's not just not us, you know, everyone down the, the chain, you know, they, they, they wanted to be Olympic high jumpers, you know, to impress Johnny and Steve. Um, and every, everyone in the, in, the, in the company had that uh, enthusiasm to, to, to do it. Um, so, you know, when it um, comes to your product or your startup, you know, it's not the idea really that matters, you know, but what you do with the idea, how much effort you put in, how you shape it, how you move forward, all this requires great amount of effort. You know, as they say, ideas are dime a dozen, right? What, what you do with it is what really matters. Um, And you know what? What really? You think if you have an idea, now you know I have a few startup founders here uh, in the front row. So I think if you have an idea, right? There are hundred other people; they have the same idea. So you know what would set you apart from them is how much effort you put in it and how you move it forward. So just by, you know, sitting on the idea, nothing is going to happen, right? So I think that's that's the reason. You know, I think effort. Is, is, is really important in whatever you do, um, be it you know uh, your product, company, career, or anything. Uh, it's really about the effort you put in. Uh, now, in the context again of uh, product design, uh, directing your effort in the in the right direction requires focus, and this focus <coughs> or the concentration. Other dhyana is is the fourth wisdom I would like to talk about. You know, with so much going on around you, how can you keep your talent focused? And at Apple, we had this thing, need to know policy. I think it's common in all the on all the corporates. Um, but it gave us just the right amount of information to effectively get our job done. We had project codes, for example, K93, Q79, M42, and only the people who were assigned to the project knew what actually it meant and what it is, right? So even if you got an email by mistake describing something about a, a project, you would have no idea what product they're talking about. Uh, our design studio, you know, which was run by uh, Johnny Ives, also had a very strict um, need to enter policy. So as an intern in product design, I could go there anytime. But our CFO could not get in. He had no reason to know, you know what the future products might look like. Um, we even went further. You know, the, the people on the same project uh, may not have inf all the information. And I'll give you an example, you know, when we were doing the iPad. Uh, so I was on the product design hardware side. And so what we would do is, and this is during the development, not after production. So we would finish building the prototypes and then put that into a rectangular box, which is a temper proof. And only the screen was exposed. And then we would give this off to the software people. So they could only turn on the screen and and load their you know, operating system. So they had no reason to know what the shape of the iPad would be, what the color might be, what the finish might be. All, all, only their job was to load the operating system and do their job. For us, we didn't know what the operating system would look like. For us, it was just a black screen that we then gave it, gave it off to the software people. And none of us knew the name of the product we were working on. You know, was it the iPad? Is it called an iTablet? Or what is it? You know, and um, we frankly, you know, did not care. Uh, um, w everyone was, was focused on playing their part in building the best product humanly possible. This another way, you know, we uh, kept focus, and and that is we organized our teams based on functions. So. All the software engineers were reporting to the head of software, and then all the mechanical engineers were reported the mechanical 
you know, all the industrial designers would report to Johnny and so on and so forth. And then for every project would pick the right, the right people from each of these teams and form the whole company-wide teams. And what happened is that as you went up the management chain in your organization, the people were smarter and smarter in that, in their subject matter expertise. What I see today in many corporates is uh, higher you go, the dumber people become uh, in that subject matter expertise. You know, it's, it's true, you know, uh, even including our company. You know, today you are head of engineering, tomorrow you are head of sales, and even maybe a head of HR, you know. So um, it's very hard to get respect, you know, from your team when you are not a su subject matter expert uh, that you lead, the lead your team on, right? So that was, you know, uh, another way uh, that Apple kept uh, the focus, um, engineers focused and uh, built like really, really high performing teams. The next wisdom, you know, after focus is uh, patience. Right. You, you need to have patience to, to build, build great products. And to talk about patience, you know, I'll tell you a story. And I think you guys got to be patient. It's a little long story. Uh, and I think some of you also might have heard it, you know, uh, if you watch some YouTube and stuff. And it's like, it's about my own journey at Apple. Um, this is in the early uh, 2000s. Um, I had just finished my master's at Stanford, and I was going on to the PhD program there. Um, and I took a summer off to go to Apple uh, to do an internship, my second internship. Um, and there, I was made part of a, a, a team that was working on the secret <coughs> project. And what we were doing at that time on that secret project was building the first ever touchscreen at Apple. Um, and this was at the time where, you know, touchscreen was, was those stylus, you know, like the, the plastic stylus and you have to poke, like, you know, ping, 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 one, one poke at a time. Um, you know, imagine, you know, how difficult it would be to write your name, you know, forget about the emails, right? And um, we were, what we were working on, like, you know, is, is the, the, the touch screens you, you see today, you know, just that it was very big. Uh, and we had really cool demos of uh, map. And we could like just glide our fingers and, you know, zoom onto the map, turn the map. It was uh, like just revolutionary stuff at that time. Um, and what we did was uh, we worked on this uh, the entire summer. And at the end of the summer, um, the guys told me, you know, this is going to be, you know, the, the, the next big thing. Uh, why do you want to go back to school? You know, you'll learn much more thing here, and, you know, this is the cooler thing to do. So, yeah, so I, I, I dropped out of my PhD program and, and joined uh, Apple full time. Um, in a few months, you know, we kept working on this, and we built our first prototype where we put that touch screen into a tablet. And we, we showed it to uh, Steve Jobs and got very positive uh, feedback and a bunch of things to improve upon. And we went back after a few months. And this back and forth uh, happened like for almost two years. You know, uh, One time, um, we were asked to change the size of the screen uh, from 13 inch to 7 inch. Um, he thought that if you are creating a tablet, it has to fit inside a, a jacket pocket. I don't know where that came from, but you know, yes. So we went, uh, spent another few months, came back with a smaller tablet. Uh, then they're like, you know, then he thought that we need to give our users an experience of having a full size keyboard on their tablet. So we had to then increase the size minimum to 10 inches. Uh, so we went back again. Uh, another time, um, it was about, should we have like a stand? Should we have a dog? How many kinds of dogs we need to have? Uh, sometimes it was like, you know, should it be like horizontal or vertical? Should it be uh, read as a book? Or it would be like a, a laptop? And so for each of these questions, 
we had to uh, prototype and and do a demo to to Steve. Uh, and doing this, you know, we over these two years we had like hundreds of uh, uh, prototypes lying in our labs. And 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 one day, uh, one of the software engineers who had access to our uh, tablets, he created like a, a user interface. And uh, this user interface is now called uh, a rubber band effect. You know, and this rubber band effect is, for example, when you get to the end of the screen and you, uh, the screen kind of bounces back, you know, so this is called a rubber band. Um, and he was, you know, playing with different user interfaces and he thought of showing this to Steve. Uh, he brought to, he took our tablet, he built that interface on the tablet and he showed it to Steve Jobs. And when he saw that, he really jumped out of the chair and he said, uh, I know what to do with this. And the next day, our project was canceled. And they asked us to give the touchscreen to the another team who was working on, a, on a, another secret project. And two late years later, the iPhone was launched with our screen you know, that we had created you know, over the last two years. Um, this was very common. Um, but you know, uh, after our tablet team got, got disbanded, I um, went on to lead uh, a team that developed iPod Shuffle, the world's smallest MP3 player. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this. You, know, you could clip it, you know, and it was so tiny. Um, and then I moved to China to be a part of the, the, the product design team uh, that was, we called in region. Yeah. Um, and there, um, I worked on many things, including MacBooks, uh, iMac, um, uh, and then as the, the luck would have it, I was uh, reunited with the tablet team when we finally decided to give it another go. Uh, and this time, you know, we took it uh, all the way. Uh, and I was there to see the first few units roll off the production line uh, uh, at Foxconn factory in Shenzhen. You know, it's a long story. It took me eight years, you know, to finally uh, realize what I had, you know, dropped out of school for. But, you know, but for Steve Jobs, he has been having this dream for more than 25 years. You know, there was, there's a very rare interview uh, in 1983 where he talks about creating this amazing, oh, he was talking about, he said, we are going to put a computer in a book. And this book is totally untethered. There are no wires. It will have a, a radio connection. And you can have everything in the world you want to learn from that book. Um, he was talking about the iPad, right? Um, and for him, um, it was the last product he created, uh, launched. Uh, and when he launched iPad, he said that, you know, it was the most significant product he had ever built. Uh, so for, for a good product, you know, to manifest, um, it takes a lot of things to, to fall in place. Uh, if we had released iPad before the iPhone, we did not have, it would be a big failure. We had no apps, we had no app ecosystem. I, iPhone is the one actually you know, paved the way to create these app stores, which then took another five years uh, to be uh, able to to be put on the on the uh, on the iPad, right? Um, and this is true, you know, for any idea, you know, like for any startup idea or for your career, you know, it everything has its time. Uh, we need to be patient, um, doing uh, the hard yards, do the right thing, keep keep putting in the effort, uh, you know, with honesty and full devotion. When the time is is right, it will happen, you know. You'll, so don't worry too much about the re results. Be be patient, you know, you know, and just keep head down and, and keep doing it. And and this brings me uh, to the to the last of the wisdoms, uh, which is the cultivation of wisdom itself, which is known as as, as santi, you know, I think in Pali. And uh, this is also the ultimate you know wisdom of of product design. 
when when steve jobs he was close to the end of his life he was uh, asked by his biographer uh, walter isaacson what was his uh, biggest achievement at apple you know was it the the iphone was it the the macintosh uh, or was it the ipad what do you guys think ipad why huh ipad what, what is it <laughs> uh, yeah, what he said was that um, it was the team that he had built at Apple, you know, that would, uh, uh, that is still, you know, uh, carrying on his legacy forward um, long after he was gone. And, you know, you, you see, you know, they, they did, you know, much more than just carry his legacy forward. They even made Apple the most valuable company uh, in the world. Right, I think Microsoft overtook Apple recently. Um, so you know, I think while 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 recruiting, it's 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 very important whom you let into your inner circle. Right, um, I think this is also what he used to say: is that uh, he said, "Remember, A's bring A players, uh, B's bring B's and C's, and soon you know your whole organization is full of mediocre people." When I was recruited as an intern, uh, I had two, and this is just an intern for internship, just a summer internship, not like a further job. Um, there were, I had two interviews on the campus. Uh, then I had two phone interviews. Then I was invited to, to the Apple's campus, and I had interviews from morning till the evening. And then, you know, they offered me uh, the internship. And when I went, uh, went back to Apple during the summer for the internship. There were 100 other interns, very bright interns from all around the country. You know, they also went through all of these things. Um, and what they did was they vetted us thoroughly during the first internship. The ones that passed the bar, they invited them the second time in the, the next summer. And the ones that, you know, did well, they were offered a full-time job when they graduated, right? So they really groomed the future stars through this internship programs. And it's a lot of effort uh, to do that. Um, and in the times of economic downturn, I see many corporates, including you know the ones I know very, very closely, they cancel their internship programs, they would stop hiring fresh graduates. You know, this is very short-term thinking and, and really hurts them in the long term. Uh, you know, at Intel, right, we make computer chips and the, the, the main ingredient there is silicon. Right? It's, that's why it's called silicon. And the silicon comes from sand. Uh, Andy Bryant, you know, he was a former uh, chairman of the board at Intel, he used to say, all we start from is sand. Everything else is the value added by people. So it's really, really important to have the right people in your organizations. You know, one way to build an amazing team is to recruit talent, like how Apple did, right? But there are superstars already within your organizations. They are lying in plain sight. You know, these are what we call intrapreneurs. You know, there are entrepreneurs inside your organization. You know, they act like you know, startup founders and, and try to do things different than the rest of the company. Uh, they are what we call the troublemakers. Right? And we try to punish them rather than you know, um, encourage them. Because you know, I think most of the, the, the so-called managers, they don't know some of these facts that the, you know, some of the greatest, most iconic products, and I'll give you just three examples. Um, I think there is one thing we cannot do without in an office or during brainstorming. What is it? Whiteboard. What do you stick on it? Post-it, yes, exactly. 
So the, the Post-it notes you know, was created at 3M as a result of a program where they allowed their employees 15% of their time and resources to build, work on technologies and products they thought were right for the company, not like so, someone telling them, right? So 3M was a result of such an intrapreneurial effort. Um, then the most successful gaming console, does anyone try to guess what? Oh, yeah, yeah, PlayStation, correct. <laughs> Do you play? No? When your dad is not watching? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the PlayStation is, is the most successful uh, like gaming console. And it was, there was an engineer at Sony called Ken Kutaragi. And his daughter once bought, I think, a Nintendo uh, gaming console. And he thought the sound was very, very bad. And he really, he, he thought he can do much better. So he started building this gaming console um, using some of the resources at work. And I think he almost got fired for doing it. I, I think his, the chairman of Sony is the one who saved him. And he was also about to be fired the second time. But he still brought that PlayStation to life, which went on to become the, the most successful gaming console. And the third example I'd like to give you know, is, is for the Macintosh itself, the Mac, right? Everyone thinks Mac is cool. Uh, and it's not Steve Jobs who came up with the idea of Macintosh. There was a guy called uh, Jeff Raskin. And in Steve Jobs' autobiography, he calls him an idiot or something, very bad language. Um, he used to write product manuals for Apple's earlier products. And what he noticed was that the products were getting more and more complicated. And he thought that's not the right direction the company is going in. So he just got together a team of youngsters and built the first prototype of what became a Macintosh. He actually you know, saved the company. Um, but we don't know about them, right? So uh, but what I'm saying is um, they these great people are still you know, in your companies. You just need to find them. Um, and as a director of innovation at Intel, one of my key focus today is to find uh, and enable and empower uh, those Raskins and Kutaragis uh, um, who will hopefully uh, change our fortunes you know, as we are trying now to uh, uh, write the the most exciting turnaround story in the tech uh, history, hopefully, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you may know what it takes to to build build a great product. You may also have all the resources, um, but you, if you don't have the right people, uh, you won't be able to build great products, and and that's the final uh, wisdom. And so, to recap. Uh, to build great products, start with a noble cause. Uh, be ethical in how uh, you build your products. Put in all uh, the required efforts and the focus uh, on the right things. Uh, be patient. Uh, all good things uh, take time. Uh, and finally, uh, the most important factor is uh, assemble a great team and empower them fully. Uh, and that's. Uh, the Zen philosophy of product design. Uh, thank you uh, all for listening and good work for This program was supported by Reliance Digital, personalizing technology.